Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our penultimate session uh, where Tim Eastman is untying the Gordian knot. We're almost ready to put a bow on this. Uh, today we will be uh, talking uh, about chapter eight uh, from Untying the Gordian Knot, focused on contextuality from experience to meaning. This was the part of the book when I got to it that I felt more at home, um, talking about consciousness and the place of uh, human beings in this in this universe. Um, I'm very excited about our respondents today. I will uh, introduce them uh, in turn after we hear from Tim, who will summarize this chapter. Um, as I mentioned, this is our penultimate session. This was going to be our last, but uh, as I mentioned last month, uh, Tim has asked uh, myself and Anderson Weeks uh, in February to do a, a wrap-up session to kind of uh, summarize what we've gone over and offer some concluding thoughts. So mark your calendars for that. And yep, that's all for me. So Tim, if you would uh, like to unmute and, and summarize this final chapter of your book for us, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, well, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you. Uh, to all of you for uh, joining in and participating on this Saturday morning. The systematic logo framework, as I have tried to pull it together uh, with various struggles uh, over the years, uh, originated with a speculative synthesis of elements from physics, which is my background in plasma physics. Uh, I also uh, had gone, uh, taken, uh, uh, some advanced courses in philosophy many years ago, but uh, had done some publications now and then in process studies and other venues, uh, some 30 plus papers over the years in philosophy, uh, separate from my physics work. So in addition to those elements from physics, philosophy, that I also really got into looking at the area of semiotics, systems theory, and other fields, trying to synthesize these things in a way to get at my basic questions. Although influenced by Peirce, Whitehead, Hartshorn, and related thinkers, this framework goes beyond those sources, especially through its metaphysical hypothesis that the fundamental succession of events, as articulated, for example, by Jorge Nobo, the fullness of reality is constituted by two fundamental orders, the order of actualizations, in which the basic logic is binary or Boolean. And secondly, the order of potentiae or potential relations in which a basic non-Boolean logic incorporates possibility. These two orders have the following overall characteristics for the, for the order of actualization. We have well-defined asymmetric input output actualizations subject to specific space-time distinctions and mappings, a plurality of things physical causality and relativistic or speed of light limitations. For the order of potentia, on the other hand, we have symmetry and fundamental contextually rich relations of possibility, fundamental pre-space unity, logical correlations as exhibited by quantum entanglement, that is a kind of logical causality, and being pre-space, independence from conventional space-time limitations. We are dominantly exposed to constraints and conditions of the order of actualizations, and yet the ubiquity of quantum process assures at all levels a fundamental linkage of these two metaphysical orders. This fundamental dance of possibility and actuality permeates all events, even though the classical approximation, which focuses on actualized states, is generally excellent for macroscopic events. events. Contemporary science is almost entirely focused on the coordination of data, that is measurement outputs, always with relativistic limitation, and on modeling the quote, the order of actualizations. However, the discovery of basic physical relations, quote, laws, unquote, reveals important constraints on potentia that weave together symmetry and asymmetry, potentia and actualizations, order and disorder, continuity and discreteness. The Logoi framework with its emphasis on the ubiquity of a fundamental physical and triadic relational nexus <clears throat> as, a, as, for example, an input-output context, that triad, suggests that certain linkages of the fundamental order should be operating constantly in the background, unconscious intentions and affective processes, for example. 
with the possibility of certain, quote, order of potentia effects becoming at times prominent, as for example, in mystical experiences, creative genius, and telepathy. Standard neuroscience research about the brain-mind connection and consciousness focuses almost entirely on the order of actualization and correlations of measurement outputs. This approach presupposes that consciousness must reduce to equivalent brain states. However, such state descriptions always derive from the more basic quantum passage from possibility to actuality, however much the classical approximation may apply to wet brain chemistry. Further, reductive models neglect how both mind and consciousness involve linkages of the two fundamental orders for which an interactive filter slash transmission model of mind and consciousness, not a reductive model, is most applicable. The notorious, quote, problem of consciousness is driven by the persistent failure of physicalist modes of description, which attend only to the order of actualization, to make sense of consciousness. The more promising approach is that of dual aspect monism, in which aspects are distinguished by epistemic splits of a unitary underlying domain. However, even this approach, enhanced with many refinements by numerous scholars over the past century, for example, as by Pauli, Jung, Bohm, Dispagna, Ottenschbacher, has not yet resolved the problem of consciousness. I propose that the needed solution can arise by positing a duality of fundamental orders as done in my untying the Gordian knot within the Logoi framework. However, such solution is only pointed to within on time. The most powerful example that I know of for which standard reductive models utterly fail is that of Srinivas Ramanujan, 1887 to 1920, an Indian mathematician who had no formal training in pure mathematics, and yet, quoting from Wikipedia, quote, he made substantial contributions to math mathematical analysis, number theory, infinite series, and continued fractions, including solutions to mathematical problems then considered unsolvable. During his short life, Ramanujan independently compiled nearly 3,900 results, many completely novel that opened entire new areas of work. Of his thousands of results, all but a dozen or two have now been proven correct. As late as 2012, researchers continue to discover that mere comments in his writings were themselves profound and subtle number theory results that remained unsuspected until nearly a century after his death." Unquote. Unlike most cases of creative genius, Ramanujan was not building on prior work or examples. I propose that Ramanujan, to an ex exceptional degree, was able to tap into the pre-space order of potentia. At multiple levels, any and all events connect with the order of potentia. However, special and unique access of this non-Boolean pre-space fundamental order may explain, may explain many features of exceptional experiences and psi phenomena. In turn, the unique features of psi phenomena and spiritual experiences may provide some of our best means to understand constraints or certain orderings and relations of the order of potentia, including among others, exceptional experiences that involve profound intuitive knowledge a deep sense of unity and wholeness, or connection with a deeper reality. Indeed, reports originating worldwide of quite exceptional experiences across all peoples and cultures suggest that they might not be very exceptional at all, except that in almost all cases, such experiences are generally ignored or suppressed. To gain improved understanding of such phenomena, we need to be evidence-based and seek out common cross-cultural features that would typically be considered characteristics of exceptional experiences of all kinds and to be skeptical of theory-driven approaches, including denialism that derive from presuming that such exceptional experiences are impossible given some actualist or physical presuppositions. Further discussions about the realities of artificial intelligence or virtual reality, as for example, in David Chalmers new book, Reality Plus Virtual Worlds, are generally limited to propositions of the order of actualization and fall short of the fundamental metaphysical distinction developed within the Logoi framework. Again, the Logoi framework that I've tried to pull together hypothesized two fundamental orders of reality, each with its distinct fundamental logic, Boolean versus non-Boolean, one of actualizations and correlations of a plurality of space-time events, and one of real possibilities, a pre-space realm of deep interconnection and unity. Although each and every event links these orders via the basic, basic quantum process, Substantial constraints and real possibilities ex expressed in physical, quote, laws substantially limit possibilities for exceptional experiences. 
Nevertheless, the cumulative evidence for some exceptional experiences is extremely strong in addition to capabilities that go beyond standard naturalistic frameworks, such as the quality of dimensions of experience, abstract reasoning, intentionality, or the overall unity of consciousness. Was Ramanushan tapping into this fundamental order of potential? Could similar tapping of the fundamental pre space realm enable other exemplars of exceptional or spiritual experience? Further, what do these phenomena tell us about the pre-space realm? Presumably, this is the same unitive realm that is hypothesized by various forms of idealism, such as in Paul Marshall's The Shape of the Soul. The wondrous, highly verified case of Ramanujan indicates that the order of potential is both accessible and universal, a basis for ultimate context. Further, if ultimate context in the spiritual dimension arise from our fundamental order of potential, then such may be appropriate, may appropriately fit in with John Cobb's God in the World, William Desmond's The Intimate Universal, and Roland Faber's The Cosmic Spirit. Another question is whether such a metaphysical realm can be pointed to as a basis for some minded reality. Lorenz Puntel, in his book Being and God, has addressed this question by arguing from a principle of ontological rank that the absolute and necessary dimension of being must be in some way minded. My project with Antine the Gordian Knot provides a starting point for such theological arguments, but in general, such efforts go beyond untying the scope. The most common metaphysical frameworks, actualism, physicalism, pluralism, idealism, monism, dualism, can all be described as conceptual branches off of the Logoi framework. For example, by dropping the order of potential, one is left with the order of actualization, that is, actualism, physicalism, pluralism. By dropping the order of actualism, in contrast, one is left with just the order of potential, for example, as in idealism or monism. By taking literal a pluralistic actuality of potential, one obtains, quote, many worlds or multiverses. And finally, by actualizing both sides, one obtains Descartes' dualism. With its emphasis on potential and their role in constraining the order of actualization versus constraints on possibility that ground physical relations, that is, laws. The Logoi framework is close in spirit to Whitehead's treatment of creativity as the most basic of universals. Nevertheless, the Logoi framework does not directly introduce eternal objects, which are suggestive of actualized forms or relations, or a God concept linked to such eternal objects, although such a concept appears to arise naturally as a grounding for the order of potentia. That's all. Thank you, Tim. So I'm going to uh, start with Reverend Dr. Tandeka, uh, if you are ready. So, yes. So Reverend Dr. Tandeka is a Unitarian Universalist minister and founder of Contemporary Affect Theology. She's also the author of several books, which are now on my wish list, uh, including most recently, Love Beyond Belief, Finding Ac the Access Point to Spiritual Awareness, uh, also, Learning to be White, Money, Race, and God in America. And her dissertation was published as The Embodied Self, Frederick Schleiermacher's Solution to Kant's Problem of the Empirical Self. So, uh, Tandeka, please, uh, the floor is yours. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and your feelings, Thank you. of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thanks yeah. to Tim, I now have a new ritual in my life. When I read a book or essay, I regularly write the word Tim as a margin note because a passage seems to highlight or need highlighting by Tim's relational Logoi lo lo framework. Tim's fundamental new theory as a generalized field theory with speculative philosophical aspects added in is a masterpiece. I find Tim's work enormously useful, inspiring, and wise. Tim, however, has issued a challenge to people like me, namely scholars in the field of theology and philosophical theology. He would like to know how persons in my field would describe a momentary experience of subjective feeling in his terms. This morning, I use three basic strategies to achieve this end. First, I present an extremely brief extremely brief case studies of the subjective feeling of separation distress experienced first by the 19th century liberal father of liberal theology, Friedrich Schleiermacher, and then by a group of baby chicks. 
Second, I analyzed three ways the use of music reduced the experiences of separation distress. I focus on music for contextual analysis because as Tim notes in chapter five of his book, his conclusions about the importance of context are complemented by an affirmation of the importance of contextual analysis and expressions for all forms of art, humanities, and music. I affirm the importance of conceptual analysis and expressions with reference to music. Third, I translate the threefold analysis of effective, con effective neuroscientists and Schleiermacher into Tim's terms. First, Schleiermacher's story. On October 9, 1805, Schleiermacher received a letter from Eleonora Grunau, the unhappily married woman with whom he had been in an unconsummated love affair for seven years. Her divorce from her husband was almost complete, so Schleiermacher expected to marry her quite soon. In her letter, she renounced any further contact with Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher was devastated. In emotional agony over the sudden and unexpected loss of his soulmate, his, his separation distress was unbearable. By December 2nd, his grief had deepened, stifling every creative activity of his life except for his lectures and preaching. The grief-stricken Schleiermacher canceled a class to attend a solo performance by the preeminent flautist of Europe, Ludwig Friedrich Ludwig Dulon, who had a widespread and well-earned reputation for stirring the feelings of his audience through his music. In concerts, Dulon introduced preludes with extended improvisations that could last 15 minutes. When a member of the audience suggested a musical theme, Dulon would play extended variations and inventions of the newly created melody for half an hour. After the concert, Schleiermacher stood next to his stove trying to make sense of what had, ha had just happened to him. He felt an explosion of creative energy and an astonishing thought came to mind. He studied his affections raised by the Dulong concert and now amplified and so sustained these feelings through religious images and ideas about the meaning of the birth of Christ. Three weeks later, um, Schleiermacher's Christmas Eve was sent off, Christmas Eve a conversation, an imaginative sermonic conversation among a group of friends who share the images and ideas generated within them as they think about the birth of Christ. Music has a major role in the narrative. The reader is told that one of the characters of, at the Christmas Eve party plays the piano, sings lyrics from the poems of romantic poets and improvises melodies to accompany the conversation. The host of the party explains the link between music and religious feelings, saying every fine feeling comes completely to the fore only when we have found the right musical expression of it. And further, it is precisely to religious feeling that music is most closely related. What the word is declared, the tones of music must make alive in harmony, conveying it to the whole inner being of its hearers and holding it fast there. The second story, the baby chicks. Baby chicks were separated from their mothers. Left in their cages without their mothers, the baby chicks displayed the typical physical signals of separation distress. Music was piped into the cages of the baby chicks. This music made them move their heads laterally in a rhythmic manner in sync with the music. And in the process, this, this decreased the distress wrought in them by separation from their mothers. The neuroscientific analysis. First, the neuroscientific analysis of what happened to the baby chicks focused on the link between acoustic dynamics and emotional dynamics. The founder of effective neuroscientists, science, Jacques Hanksepp, and neurobiologist Gunter Bernatsky, in their essay, Emotional Sounds and the Brain, hypothesized that if modulation of sound by music had the same molecular modulation patterns as a particular emotional operating system of the brain, then they could be akin. To test their hypothesis, they piped into the cages of the baby chicks, a certain kind of music that was structurally similar to the patterning principles within the brains of the baby chicks for reducing separation distress. When the separation distress was reduced, Panksept and Bernatsky concluded that the mathematical schemes common to music and to affect reveal the link between acoustic dynamics and emotional dynamics. Second, they focus on the nature and structure of affective non-cognitive possibilities regarding music, concluding that music can evoke chills and a wistful sense of loss, 
blended with the possibility of reunion in humans because of the link between acoustic dynamics and emotional dynamics. The sounds might resound in humans, they concluded, like the sound of a mother, a sound a mother makes as she cuddles and feeds her child. Accordingly, the affective pattern, as, he, as they put it, may be so well represented in the dynamics of sound that we become deeply moved. The musical experience itself, they concluded, may communicate to us the possibility of redemption, the joy of being found and then nurt and nurtured if one is lost. At a non-cognitive, purely affective level of consciousness, they thus concluded that, that musical experiences can speak to us of our profound humanness and our relatedness to other people and the rest of nature. The musical experience may communicate to us the possibility of redemption, the joy of being found and nurtured if one is lost. Schleiermacher's analysis. Schleiermacher also affirmed the link between acoustic dynamics and emotional dynamics. And so too, the human experience of the possibility of redemption experienced at the non-cognitive level of affective consciousness. Music for Schleiermacher was quite literally the transformation of physical impulses, sound into rhythmic feeling, music as a non-conceptual activity of human consciousness. The transformation, he argued, must be described from two perspectives because it entailed two forms of human consciousness simultaneously occurring. From one perspective, feeling, namely the resounding experience of the sound moving his, expect, his affections. From the other perspective, perspective, pure awareness, namely an act of understanding by the human spirit, Geist, occurring at the same time as the resounding affective experience. Schleiermacher thus acknowledged and delineated two forms of intuition that together constitute the spiritual dimension of human experience. Affective experience, which he referred to as Gifu, and pure experience, which he referred to as Anschauung. The affective mode of consciousness, Schleiermacher argued, consists of moments of affections, Schleiermacher called the neural material affect and defined it as the product of stimulated nerves for whatever or whatever else is the first ground and seat of, of motions in the human body. Accordingly, the internal result of the impressive sensations, Schleiermacher argued, is an affect, namely a neurobiological hedonic measurement and assessment of a movement of sensible self-consciousness as pleasant or unpleasant. Listening to music, was thus for Schleiermacher a form of affective consciousness. Schleiermacher's way of listening to music was described by one of his friends as sinking into the musical tones. Schleiermacher would then awaken during the breaks in the music performance and describe his experience of music rather than offered learning discourse about music. Schleiermacher, when in this state, felt himself to be quite literally an artistic creation at the moment of its birth. For Schleiermacher is the human experience of the unbounded universe, namely an experience of the infinite universe in the finite moments of one's life, which he defined as the natal hour of everything living in religion without itself being a religious experience because all religions are cultural constructions. The experience itself is the constitutive innate capacity of human nature. Schleiermacher called Anschauung or pure awareness, the null point of consciousness, because it occurred between thoughts is the place where one thought ends and the other begins. This in between place, as he put it, is not another thought, but empty of all thought as a pure state of mental awareness. The content of the unitive experience of consciousness is thus simultaneously empty of thoughts and images, Anschauung, and filled with the manifold infinite universe, Gifu. The conscious experience is thus the emptiness of thought and the infinite fullness of feeling experienced at the same time, which is of course a classic way Western traditions define mystical experience. So to William James, when he took nitrous oxide to experience what the mystics he studied felt, he watched opposites meet. According to Schleiermacher, this moment of unitive consciousness always splinters into one, a mental form distinct from the entirety of its feeling-based content, and two, a moment of raised affect, which gets determined, ordered, and arranged. This third state of consciousness for Schleiermacher thus pertains to the ordering and arrangement of ideas that we reflect on and determine the meaning of raised affect and its vibratory possibilities. As Schleiermacher notes in his brief outline of theology as a field study, field of study, religious feeling is determined and communicated by means of ideas rather than some symbolic actions and likewise religious feelings 
depends on the degree to which the feeling attains a stent historical importance and autonomy. Accordingly, from this perspective, the baby chicks did not have a spiritual experience because they did not reflect upon their regenerated feelings and produce a creative liturgical piece they could then draw on when they felt devastated, sad, and alone. The baby chicks in some did not have a religious tradition, a religious community, and thus a religious experience. Their affect was not determined religiously. The baby chicks simply experienced the reduction of their separation distress. Tim's relational framework delineates these three levels of human consciousness affirmed by Schleiermacher. First, affective consciousness. Tim described the content of his non-cognitive state of consciousness in the opening pages of his book. When he was 13, during his walk down a beautiful hillside along Big Stone Lake in Minnesota, he intensely felt the soil and grass below him, he, and he felt the throbbing life of insects, worms, and plants. Tim states, calls this state enhanced openness to pre-state potentia, calls this state an enhanced openness to pre-state potentia. The lo logoi framework opens a way to think of enhanced anticipatory systems as those capable of enhanced open openness to this pre-space, and thus at times to genuine spiritual or psychic experience. Tim reminds us that Whitehead in his essay, Mathematics and the Good, noted that the notion of the complete self-sufficiency of any item of finite knowledge is the fundamental era of dogmatism. Every such item derives its truth and its very meaning from its unanalyzed relevance to the background, which is the unbounded universe. The unbounded universe felt is a non-cognitive state of affective consciousness of pre-space potential. Second, Tim at the same time on the hillside also uh, was in a state of pure awareness. As he put it, he was suddenly, suddenly awakened to a state of awe and greater consciousness of the immensity of the natural world. This is the state of consciousness of pure awareness. In his words, he experienced a heightened awareness of our shared radical contingency of the immensity of alternative possibilities. Yes. According to Tim, this state of self-conscious awareness and its subjective feelings arise from nonlinear feedback between such contrasts and active selection, quantum process, potential to actualization, channeling these processes through the neurological system and mental models mappings, enabling various levels of anticipatory ca capability. The affective consciousness and the state of pure awareness occurred at the same time. The unitive state of consciousness immediately splintered into the third state of human consciousness, reflection. Thus, reflective consciousness. Tim now wondered how he was fundamentally like or different from the creatures around him, and he meditated on his own ignorance and fears, including his immediate past. Tim's reflective state of consciousness, in short, his mind with its conscious capabilities became the real emergent complex model system that manages all inputs given environmental context and working via complex systems modeling or unfolding inputs and unfolding responses, makes and implements decisions. Thus, Tim thus confirmed in, his three, in this threefold way, his use of the terms religion, ultimacy, and spirituality as referring to the affective attunement of the body and mind to the neurological attunement with all of life, real and potential, thus providing linkages, linkage to his Boolean and non-Boolean description of both intentional and luminous consciousness, namely the state of consciousness before it is sundered into a mind reflecting upon what the body has felt. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you, Tandeka. Um, we've had numerous requests in the chat uh, for you to share your written comments. Um, and I think we will try to collect uh, anything written by our various um, respondents over the last several months to share uh, on the Cobb Institute website. Um, so yes, thank you. We will uh, turn to our next respondents and then after everyone has spoken, we'll uh, open it up for dialogue among the, 
various respondents. Next is going to be uh, Dan uh, Dombrowski. Dr. Dombrowski is a professor of philosophy at Seattle University. Uh, he's the author of over 20 books. I'll mention a few of the more recent ones. Uh, Process Philosophy and Political Liberalism, Rawls, Whitehead, and Hartshorn, published in 2019, and Whitehead's Religious Thought, From Mechanism to Organism, From Force to Persuasion, published in 2017. Uh, Dan is also the editor of Process Studies, as many of you probably know. Uh, Dan, the floor is yours. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Matt. And thanks, Tim, for your book, obviously. <laughs> That's why we're here. Uh, 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 so the chapter we're talking about today um, uh, deals with uh, an integrated framework and the meaningfulness of the world uh, that's connected to that integrated framework. And I, I like Tr Tim's idea that uh, people who challenge the meaningfulness of the world may end up committing a performative contradiction in their efforts. Um, uh, what I would like to do, I'd like to ask a question about the extent to which this framework for meaningfulness is compatible with Plato. So I'm going to have us concentrate on Plato. Um, and to see the extent to which a consideration of Plato will help us better understand Tim and uh, the big issues that Tim is dealing with here. And I'd like to deal with three uh, topics in particular. Uh, the first deals with the different modes of expressing the logos. So the label for Tim's position is the Logoi framework. Um, and uh, I take it that you know, the logos could be uh, transmitted in quite different ways. And I'm wondering about the relationship between them. Um, and I'm going to try to unpack here um, Tim's uh, use of black elk toward the end of this chapter. Um, uh, so um, I take it that oral transmission of the Lagos through myth among pre-literate peoples, um, so through oral, oral, O-R-A-L, A-U-R-A-L discourse, um, has as its primary characteristic transitoriness. So when one speaks the word, um, falls, you know, out of existence almost instantaneously, right? Um, such that if you want to remember stuff in a pre-literate culture, um, you need mnemonic devices, right? You express yourself either in some sort of sing-songy cadence or rhymes at the end of lines or use figures of speech to try to preserve what needs to be remembered um, uh, through the, the, this oral performance of myth, it, it, very often in a ritual context, you know, some sort of religious context. I take it that that is quite different from a literate transmission of the Lagos. Um, so that reading and writing as a type of discourse has as a primary characteristic permanence. So when you write something down, it's gonna hang around <laughs> presumably forever. Actually, we're still reading Homer. I did, some of the first books that were ever written you can still get in the library. Um, now, the permanence of the Lagos found in literacy uh, creates a need for analysis. Um, and then I'm relying on the dual meaning of the Greek word lysis here, which means both to liberate something, but also to destroy it in the liberation process. Um, so in the separation from the source of oral spontaneity, there's a chance through literacy to slow down and reread things and in some way or another give rise to analytical skills. So I'm thinking here of Marshall McLuhan, you know, this dictum, the, the medium is the message. I, I wonder if the same Lagos can be expressed orally that that is expressed in a literate medium, or if the means by which we convey the Lagos at least partially determine what is expressed. Um, I guess a lot of us are thinking about that stuff these days in terms of the electronic media, you know, how is what we're doing now different from a conference in person? How does teaching online differ from being in person and so on? And I'm asking the question as to how orality differs from literacy. Now, what's interesting about Plato's dialogues is that he tries to bridge these two logoi, right? It's a literate medium uh, that tries to preserve the cast of the spontaneity of oral discourse. And I like Tim's reference to deep listening, right? That maybe is made possible, you know, by documents like Plato's dialogues. Actually, I think that um, in Plato's sophist, uh, 
where dialogue is a model for reality in general seems to be very compatible with what Tim is doing here. So that in the sophist, Plato tries to advance the thesis that what being is power or dynamis, specifically the power to affect others and the power to be affected by others. That sort of relational view that Plato has there seems to be very close to what Tim is doing. And I take it that the Greek chi and is needed rather than ite or or. So it's not just that you have an impact on others, uh, but also that you are impacted by others in a relational worldview. Now, Tim notices uh, earlier in the book that literacy extends the range of direct human experience. The way Tim puts it is, you know, literacy enables you to learn about other places and cultures. Um, I'm, I'm trying to push it a little bit further and saying that literacy does something else. It changes the way we think, right? It makes possible analytical thought. Uh, so I'm trying to understand Tim's use of black elk, where black elk is uh, an oral mythic believer, right? Um, but also he's a Platonist of a sort, okay? <laughs> he talks a lot about this world and the other world. Um, and I'm wondering about... Um, the extent to which the view of the world that Tim has that a lot of us share who are in this, you know, reading group um, is compatible with indigenous wisdom, or is it, 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 is, is it fair to say that it's the same as what you find in Black Elk? Um, in one sense, um, you could read Black Elk as not encouraging a pole vault out of this world into another world, but rather trying to get us to, to have a different uh, sort of appreciation for this world. T Tim refers to it as a co-present spiritual dimension to the world. Um, uh, so anyhow, that's the first area I wanted to ask questions about, uh, orality and literacy and the extent to which indigenous wisdom is the same as or compatible with or analogous to the sort of thing that Tim is doing. Um, so let me move on. Second point deals with the relationship between necessity and contingency, and I take it that uh, Tim's thesis here is very much compatible with Plato because Tim thinks that it's impossible for everything to be contingent. And Tim also thinks that it's what impossible to assimilate everything to necessity. Um, so regarding the impossibility of everything being contingent, uh, Tim suggests that atheism rests on that mistake to think that everything could be contingent. Um, uh, and this is because Tim thinks that uh, absolute nothingness is unintelligible, and this goes back to Plato in Parmenides, right? Um, although relative not, uh, nothingness or otherness may exist, and this was Plato's parasite on Father Parmenides to suggest that relative non-being uh, may be intelligible, but not absolute non-being. Tim's way to put it is uh, in, uh, to say what? That, the quantum in scare quotes vacuum is full of processes, right? Uh, uh, so he's in agreement with Plato there, but it's also impossible to assimilate everything to necessity. And Tim thinks that determinism rests on this mistake and determinism is a metaphysical view, not a scientific one as he sees things. Um, so counterfactual possibilities are needed to understand factuality itself. Um, and in this regard, he, points to indeterminate features of quantum physics. And also in, instructively, the difference between causal order and logical order. Logical order may lead us to, you know, flirt with, you know, necessary relations everywhere. But causal order is diachronic, whereby uh, effects contain causes and not vice versa. So I, I think uh, Tim's stance, his moderate stance is instructive that what reality has contingent and necessary features. And you don't want to lean too far in one direction or the other. So that's the secondary. So, so the first area was uh, trying to understand uh, different expressions of the logos and the implications of, you know, uh, uh, orality versus literacy. And secondly, uh, I wanted to call attention to Tim's moderate stance regarding contingency and necessity. Now, the third area I'd like to ask some questions about deals with the cosmos as a complex whole. And Tim admits this is an undeveloped part of a comprehensive narrative. Um, I, I wanted to ask whether or not Tim uh, thinks his view is compatible with Plato's world soul. Uh, at least I was thinking about Plato's world soul and trying to understand what uh, Tim was getting at. Uh, and in this regard, 
uh, I'm relying more on Hartshorn than Whitehead. You know, Hartshorn embraces the concept of Plato's concept of the world soul, and Whitehead's a bit more reticent. And th this concept may be very close to what Black Elk means by Wakantaka, okay? Now that his view of God seems to be something very close to the world soul. This would be a belief in a sort of cosmic hylomorphism. So whereas each one of our, our mind or soul uh, uh, it, souls do what animate this or that particular body but if there were a god it would be the sort of being who would animate the whole body of the cosmos okay um uh, now Tim is clear that he's opposed to many or most monological grand narratives and big histories because they tend to assume what actualism substantialism and determinism but there's some versions of integrative wholeness presumably that he accepts um, but they would have to dialogically um, rely on both more scientific grounding on the one hand and then humanistic approaches so as to combat disenchantment on the other. Um, one phrase that he uses that I like a lot is that he thinks that we should have humility before the radically inclusive non-contingent. Isn't that a nice phrase? You know, we should have humility before the radically inclusive non-contingent. And he's quite um, willing to use an organic metaphor to describe this integrative framework. And that's what gets me thinking about the uh, the world soul, right? Tim seems to be pointing towards some sort of cosmic organism. Um, uh, he affirms a divine reality. And this is another phrase that he uses that I like. Uh, so, as, so as to combat the hegemony of non-mystical states. <laughs> okay, this sort of muscular <laughs> uh, approach to non-mystical states, uh, which may not exhaust all the sort of experiences we would have. Uh, he's also clear that uh, um, we cannot rely exclusively on blind chance because such would be astronomically improbable. Now, I think it's clear that, play, that, that Tim is opposed to any sort of otherworldly supernaturalism. OK, um, but that does not nece necessarily mean that he would be opposed to Platonism, although at times Tim seems to interpret Plato as a sort of unhistorical dualist. But there is another way of viewing Plato, uh, such that Plato, perhaps like Black Elk um, and Hartshorn and others, is um, alerting us to another dimension of this world rather than having us pole vault into some sort of other world. Um, and this relates to the to the question that Tim is very much interested in regarding the status of potentiae and uh, universals or eternal objects. Um, they can't, can't flow in to the universe from nowhere, okay? Uh, and I take it that the approach that Tim wants to take is one that I think take, Plato takes as well, is that the forms or potentiae are intradeical rather than extradeical, right? They're, they're thoughts in the mind of God or the world soul rather than having some sort of independent, uh, um, unintelligible existence outside of this world. So those are the three areas I was thinking about. Um, but I think there's more of Plato in this book than appears on the surface. And, and I take it that's a good thing, by the way, <laughs> in those three areas. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Wow. Rich comments so far. I look forward to the discussion here. We have one more respondent, uh, Dr. Edward Kelly. Uh, Ed was with us last month as well. Um, he's a research professor in the Division of Perceptual Studies at the Department of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Studies at the University of Virginia. And he's also the editor of a couple of wonderful books, Irreducible Mind, uh, Tortoise Psychology for the 21st Century, which was published in 2007 and beyond physicalism toward reconciliation of science and spirituality uh, published in 2015. Uh, Ed, we look forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me without any uh, strange noises, um, which are supposed to be suppressed by these headphones in some way I don't understand. Uh, I had uh, hoped to write down my comments and the way I could circulate, particularly to Tim in advance and uh, uh, develop them further, but I was unable to do that. Um, so I'm going to be kind of winging it from an outline that I've written, which is itself a little uh, uh, broken and scattered here and there. Uh, 
there are lots of points of contact between Tim's work and ours. By ours, I mean that of the uh, Esalen Fellowship that I led for 20 plus years and produced those books. Uh, and these really uh, come to the fore, especially in chapter eight, which uh, I, like Matt, uh, found more, uh, much closer to my normal habitat, let's say, in uh, dealing you know, upfront with uh, aspects of consciousness and human experience and so on, rather than the very abstract matters uh, covered in the rest of the book. Uh, and uh, what I wanna do here is basically to bring to the fore one, one particular question uh, about the relationship between Tim's approach and ours. Um, to start with, uh, I mean, to summarize what's at stake in all this, I could not possibly do better than to read Tim's last sentence of this wonderful book. In confronting the psychological challenges of nihilism, denialism, and assorted despairs of contemporary life, and facing up to the physical threats of war, pandemics, human suffering, and in newly realizing the deterioration of Earth's climate, ecology, and habitability, can we somehow embrace what we have learned through science and philosophy and what we may yet draw on from indigenous and other spiritualities so as to bring into being a world in which we humans can live and flourish over the long term. Amen, brother. That's what this is really all about. Uh, let me just uh, add a, a favorite quote of mine uh, in the same spirit. This is from William James, uh, and it's in the conclusion to the last book published in his lifetime, A Pluralistic Universe. He says, and I quote, let empiricism once become associated with religion, as hitherto, through some strange misunderstanding, it has been associated with irreligion, and I believe that a new era of religion as well as of philosophy will be ready to begin. Here, here, and science too, we might add. So, um, the basic situation seems to me that uh, there is something new in the wind. Uh, increasing numbers of people, uh, including lots of academics in multiple fields, uh, have a sense that something is fundamentally wrong about the kind of physicalism and scientism that constitutes the received wisdom of all sorts of self-appointed opinion elites all over the planet. And in particular, I must say the parts of the scientific community that I routinely interact with, namely uh, psychologists and neuroscientists. Uh, that sort of physicalism and scientism is inadequate and pernicious, and it has to be replaced with some kind of expanded, and I think science-based, uh, conceptual framework or uh, worldview or metaphysics capable in particular of accommodating a wider variety of real human experiences. Um, Tim, in his characteristic way, explicitly recognizes a bunch of other attempts in the same direction. I think he uh, briefly reviews six or eight of them anyhow, and ours is yet another. I'm gonna speak mainly in terms of the relationship between our way of doing things and his, and try to get some clarity about that. Uh, but to start with, the, the, the key phenomena in question here are uh, the various forms of psi phenomena, uh, extreme forms of creative genius, and mystical experiences of diverse sorts. Uh, the point about psi phenomena, of course, is that by definition, they involve information flows between organisms and their environments uh, that cross barriers of some sort that in conventional physical uh, terms would be sufficient to prevent their occurrence. So for example, uh, ESP experiments 
the target might be in the next room or it might be 5,000 miles away or it might not be picked until sometime in the future. And these barriers ought to be sufficient for people to be unable to discover what the targets are, and yet they do, as shown uh, not only by a couple of thousand experiments now collectively, but also by large numbers of spontaneous experiences, uh, typically of very important and personal sorts that people have had and that are well documented in the literature. Uh, in regard to genius, uh, Tim's already uh, spoken about Ramanujan, and we talked about him also in our book, Irreducible Mind, in the genius chapter. I mean, the guy's just totally off the charts in terms of the, the things that he accomplished. Uh, and an important feature here is one that uh, F.W.H. Myers called uh, incommensurability, that is, um, experiences of creative genius often come in forms that are markedly different from everyday kinds of thought. The kinds of uh, uh, mentation is uh, speedy, complex, highly precise. It has features just not present in ordinary cognition. That was certainly true of Ramanujan's cognition. A uh, sort of homely example can be found in something like Savant syndrome, and F.W.H. Myers made a great deal of this. For example, uh, a great case in point is that of the twins who were studied by Oliver Sacks. Here you had uh, two kids who could not successfully add or subtract uh, single digit numbers under ordinary conditions, and yet it came to light that they had some quite extraordinary capacities. Uh, the way this happened was that uh, Sachs uh, knocked a batch of, uh, of matches on the floor one day, and these two kids instantly and simultaneously said, 111, 37, 37, 37. Now, there were two things going on here. First of all, they had instantly apprehended the total number of matches on the floor, and Sachs counted them in order to be sure. He thought about the other thing for a while before he realized that what they had done was they had implicitly factored 111 into the product of two prime numbers, 3 and 37. And for that reason, he started a little game with them uh, involving prime numbers and showed that they could generate prime numbers. They quickly went to uh, beyond 10 or 12 digits, which was the uh, biggest table that he had, and eventually were producing 20-digit numbers that were ostensibly prime. Now, these kinds of things can only be verified by uh, supercomputers even now, and yet these kids were somehow doing it. Uh, the point is that uh, minds have capabilities that are not routinely expressed, but can be expressed under conditions that we don't know very much about as yet, but could presumably uh, learn more about by applying our normal sorts of scientific and experimental investigative techniques. Uh, this would clearly have a great bearing on the important possibility of transformation, that is, making these uh, kinds of latent abilities more available uh, for both personal and collective good, so that there is a, there is definitely a kind of applied aspect to this process of theory development and a natural way to think about it uh, from my point of view as a psychologist. Uh, the third area, mystical experiences, um, of course, uh, Tim's lifelong search was driven by his experience as a young man in Minnesota. Uh, you'll be interested to know, Tim, that of the 50 or so people who participated in our, our group, at least eight or 10 are similarly driven by mystical experiences that they've had in the course of their lives. Um, by anybody's uh, calculation, the uh, probability of that uh, degree of involvement of the mystical in the work of our group is uh, essentially zero. And I'd like to say just that, uh, again, um, the idea that these reflect some higher state of consciousness that is accessible to us, or states of consciousness that are accessible to us as humans, uh, the disregard and um, um, mistreatment 
of the mystical in contemporary science and particularly psychology and neuroscience is to my mind totally scandalous. And uh, if nothing else, I hope that our work has uh, helped to encourage more scientists to take the subject seriously. Anyway, now, um, oh, and by the way, um, one of my co-editors, Paul Marshall, uh, has written what I think is the best thing about uh, mystical experience since Walter Stace's book, Mysticism and Philosophy. It's called Mystical Encounters with the Natural World, Experiences and Explanations. Um, and Paul is one of the people who, by the way, whose work has been driven by his own mystical experience. He was a uh, phys physics student at Cambridge before turning to uh, comparative religion and mysticism. Now, uh, so in our way of uh, dealing with all these um, unusual experiences, uh, we've approached the subject, uh, and my colleagues that is, uh, primarily from the viewpoint of psychology and neuroscience, that's our natural habitat, and we brought in a number of people who are uh, scholars of religion. By the way, they're all very careful to call themselves scholars of religion rather than religious scholars. There's a kind of political aspect <laughs> to that, as you can imagine. And uh, what we did, uh, basically, the, the first book collected in one place a lot of evidence uh, showing the inadequacy of physicalism. Uh, the second book, Beyond Physicalism, attempted to bring together a bunch of um, conceptual frameworks or worldviews, including uh, mystically based or mystically informed religious philosophies, some views from physics and some views from Western philosophy, all of which took seriously the possibility of all the different kinds of unusual experiences that we've talked about and sought to uh, present a, a picture of the world that could explain how these things can happen. And in doing that, I mean, we went on for years trying to put this together and we gradually became aware that they all were tending in a certain consistent direction, not very clearly defined. We have nothing resembling a, you know, a final worked out theory of things. Uh, but that the picture that we work toward is essentially, and that most of us are kind of uh, at least tentatively committed to, really amounts to a sort of evolutionary panentheism of the type uh, developed by people like Charles Horchorn, Horchorn and David Ray Griffin growing out of Whitehead's work uh, and including a lot of grounding in uh, philosophy and theology. I recommend the book by uh, Hartshorn and Reese, Philosophers Speak of God. Um, and uh, in chapter 14 of Beyond Physicalism, uh, I trace that development in the case of William James. And I want to just very briefly summarize this. I know I'm wearing on longer than I probably should, but I'd, I'd like to kind of get the, the basics of this out. It's going to be very uh, terse and uh, telegraphic. I hope it will make sense because it's the basis for the question that I then want to pose to Tim. Um, James built very strongly on the work of F.W.H. Myers, uh, who was one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research. The central thrust of Myers's great book, Human Personality and its Survival of Bodily Death, is to show empirically that we are more complicated than we seem, that our everyday consciousness is really a included within a larger consciousness of which we're normally not aware, have no contact, direct contact with, um, that among other things provides access to larger portions of reality than we're normally aware of through our senses, hence will become an explanation for the possibility of psi phenomena. Can also explain things like mystical experience. Myers, Myers described his theoretical construct as the subliminal self, capital S, capital S, this larger consciousness, and spoke of mystical experiences uh, or, or a mystical experience as a, 
kind of expansion of the everyday or supraliminal self to the point of view of the subliminal self that is stepping back to this larger, more inclusive consciousness. Um, without dwelling on that further, let me just say that William James used Myers's model of personality uh, in varieties of religious experience, the best-selling psychology book of all time. He's quite explicit about this. He states clearly that Myers's work justified this conception, which he then uses to explain the various kinds of religious phenomena. And at the end of VRE, he kind of hits at larger implications of this point of view, and he develops those larger implications in particularly a pluralistic universe and his work on logical empiricism. And what he gets to, James, uh, building on Myers, as I said, and with help from Bergson, uh, develops a picture in which there are there is a kind of hierarchy of increasingly expansive consciousnesses leading up to some highest level. Uh, he doesn't pretend to know what that highest level is, uh, but he does feel very strongly that it cannot be the absolute of contemporary uh, idealists such as uh, Bradley and his own colleague Royce. That's a concept that he loathes and despises. He regards it as a, uh, he talks about the, that conception of an absolute idealism as uh, the unintelligible pantheistic monster, uh, the product of uh, uh, vicious rationality unconstrained by facts. So here we get back to the importance of empiricism and grounding things in real science. So, um, Without dwelling upon that any further, that's the, the general kind of picture that most of us in, in the SIRSEM, the Esalen group, are drawn to. Uh, the idea that there is some kind of highest consciousness that is at the source of everything, that grounds everything, uh, that accounts for uh, the various kinds of uh, exceptional experience that we think motivate the repudiation of conventional physicalism. Um, you know, the idea that from a psychological point of view, that uh, our everyday consciousness, this is Huxley's metaphor of a reducing valve, that what we get is a measly trickle of the uh, sort of higher consciousness that uh, lies on our far side, so to speak. And that by uh, uh, getting ourselves into appropriate physical states, we can assist the expression of that, the capabilities of that higher consciousness or consciousnesses through our organisms. I mean, I'm lapsing into kind of dualistic talk, which is natural for me as a psychologist, but uh, what it uh, really comes from is a kind of layered idealism of the sort I attempted to summarize. And that's what has the implications for personal and maybe collective transformation. Okay, well, that's how we've approached it. But now uh, here comes Tim, who approaches really the same issues from a very different perspective. I mean, Tim's background, as we all know, is in physics and math and logic and so on. Uh, as I confessed last time, uh, large parts of this book are really uh, I have to say beyond my pay grade, uh, and I don't pretend to understand them very well. Uh, but what is very clear to me at this point, and Tim really emphasized it, I think, uh, correctly at, in his introductory remarks today, is that he attempts primarily through the postulation of a reality which has two sort of ontological departments, the actual and the possible, by advancing that. Um, larger concept of what's real, he can uh, similarly begin to perhaps explore these kinds of exceptional human capacity. Um, and so, I mean, for me as a psychologist, that's a big reach because as I said, uh, 
his sort of conceptual framework is so exceedingly abstract uh, from my point of view. Um, and the question is, uh, to what degree it can be brought into better alignment with the kind of picture that we have developed through our Esalen Fellowship, which makes consciousness itself so fundamental to the whole scheme of things. And my sense is, and again, uh, amplified a bit by what Tim's already said, that despite the very different uh, starting points, uh, we're really not as far apart as it might seem at the outset. Um, I, I was encouraged in this direction, I must say, by reading one of the papers that Tim cited. It's the one by uh, Ruth Kastner and Stuart Kaufman and uh, Michael Epperson, who uh, arrived at this basic idea that the, the possible is ontologically as real as the actual and so on. Uh, these are three different kind of physics-driven research programs that have kind of semi-independently come to the same sort of picture that Tim is then building upon in his work. Uh, and they speak, uh, they, di they divide the, the possible into sort of two domains. One is that of quantum potentiae, you know, having to do with the kind of stuff that goes on in quantum physical experiments. But they clearly embrace the idea that there's a kind of larger realm of potentiae, the race potentiae and give it just a few hints about it. And Tim has begun to develop some of those further. And, and I must say, if, from my own point of view, the thing that uh, leaped to mind immediately uh, in reading that Kastner paper is uh, Jung's, Carl Jung's archetypes. You know, these are associated with the unconscious. I can just mention that Jung's unconscious, his picture of personality is actually very similar to Myers's except that for him the unconscious really is unconscious it's dark it's um uh, and he speaks there because of that of mystical experiences as, as being the, the real consciousness the everyday consciousness being overwhelmed by this dark stuff from his unconscious uh, myers of course had a similar idea of a more inclusive something subliminal but his is conscious, not unconscious. And James strongly supports that point of view. But the archetypes, you see, are part of this underlying something. Uh, for him, there are few. Uh, and when he got together with physicist Wolfgang Pauli, Pauli uh, strongly uh, urged him to make the whole thing much more dynamic, which again brings it into better alignment with what Tim's talking about. I wanted to mention also in response to uh, Dan, uh, I really resonated to what you said about uh, connections to Plato. And in fact, uh, particularly to, I think, Neoplatonism. Uh, Myers was a big uh, Plotinus fan, knew it in Greek. Uh, and I've recently discovered a book by Dan Gerson called From Plato to Neo, From Plato to Platonism, in which he portrays Neoplatonism as the ultimate development of Plato's work. And it, I think, I mean, Neoplatonism is one of the uh, primordial sources of, um, of panentheism historically. So um, my uh, question and challenge to Tim, and I, I don't imagine we can possibly answer it in this brief conversation, but I think it's, the subject maybe for further exploration, both in this conversation and some kind of ongoing interaction, is to explore in more deep depth uh, this whole idea of race potentiae and exactly what it comprises. Um, well, I think I will just stop there. I hope that made sense. A lot of territory and not much time. Thank you, Ed. Um, big questions, big questions. Uh, is the realm of potentia conscious, right? Uh, is, uh, is there any relationship to the world soul, as Dan was asking? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tandeika uh, pointing out the connections between uh, our affective relationship to the 
infinite fullness of the universe? And in and, and what ways are these related to your concept of uh, the realm of potentia, uh, Tim? Um, we'll, we'll turn it over to you, Tim, just to respond to these great uh, comments and questions that have been raised. Um, anything that you can offer, they are big questions. We don't expect answers, but share your thoughts with us. Well, these are really great uh, respondents and, uh, and presentations, uh, lots of great questions, and I certainly can't respond to all of that uh, in any finite time frame. Uh, but let's see, Ed sort of indicated, well, sort of like uh, that the concepts I bring, there's some aspect that they're, they're kind of rather, you know, uh, theoretical or hard to kind of grasp. Uh, and yet I'd like to argue that uh, that what I'm pointing to by the fundamental orders are, are radically immediate in our experience in the sense that the uh, every uh, every transition from from uh, in, in, in the process of succession, one, one darn thing after the other. Uh, that is that there's always and everywhere uh, this uh, input of the realm of possibility and the given actuals and the particles and fields input into a given uh, particular, uh, uh, the input into what's making us at each stage, uh, that this is happening again and again and again at, uh, with exceeding high frequency, uh, and 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 in each quantum process, uh, there fundamentally is this bridging, this integration of the possible and the actual. Uh, my hypothesis is simply saying that at the most fundamental level, I take it as a metaphysical hypothesis because it can't be proven, quote, scientifically by virtue of observational outputs. Uh, there is an inference about, you know. A, a, a theoretical inference about what 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 can account uh, event, event, what is so to speak presupposed in terms of explaining the basis for say the existence of quantum field theory, which I think is one way of a point a pointer to what corresponds to this fundamental succession that that time at time in terms of time space is not explicit not so to speak foundational in quantum field theory, so to speak, arises out of quantum field theory. That is that there's sort of like a succession of events, one after the other. Uh, and that time and space in our normal description uh, and Einsteinian description is emergent from the fundamental process. It's not, so to speak, to be put into at the beginning. And this, and so when we think of terms of consciousness and uh, you know, the, the co constant contrast of that which may be to the givens, uh, that interplay, that self-reflection on that which may to be to that which can may be the possibilities to the givens, that interaction of that uh, that that interplay uh, is has counterparts in the interplay of uh, f fundamental uh, the succession of the the inputs of particles and fields and and that is that input is uh, by by the hypothesis I put together in is include needs to include uh, when you put together the science and philosophy the, the reference to this to the the fundamental orders that that possibility is part of this and that Ruth Kastner's possibilism uh, in in her work in co combining with Epperson is pointing to a scientific way of describing or understanding this possibilism as fundamentally ingredient in a way that's I think uh, that there's a that, that the possible and the actual is joined at the hip in every event at multiple levels um, and and uh, and, and this, and, and to me, there's a convergence here, at least a possibility for a convergence of, say, the psychological ways of looking at things, the semiotic set of ways of describing things in terms of input, output, uh, context, and the scientific and modeling descriptive kinds of ways that Robert Rosen describes. Uh, there's a, 
I think there's uh, a way of putting this together that then connects with our immediacy of experience that in, can incorporate uh, these unusual uh, exceptional experiences, including psi phenomena that are tapping in, or at least revealing uh, the, the range of, uh, of, of the non-Boolean order uh, that, that by virtue of focusing on just correlations of outputs and space-time specifications of things as though we have a God's eye view of all that, then that scientific description um, can't directly get at this more fundamental connection. We have to hypothesize it. Uh, and I'm just suggesting that uh, by hypothesizing these two fundamental orders, it's a way to get at, in a fairly, I think, simple way to get at the fundamental connection that, uh, and uh, so, so what I put on the table with my Logoi framework is a starting point for a new way of approaching it, but that is highly compatible in various ways with, uh, with, with all the inspirations coming from the traditions of, of the process traditions and semiotic traditions. Uh, so it's, 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 it, I'm, I'm attempting to, uh, to bring together uh, these, uh, the, these, these descriptions, the scientific and the humanistic, the, the, uh, the actual and the possible, uh, and, and just pointing out that if you don't, if you, if, if you just attend to one extreme, then you, you, you end up with these inadequate descriptions such as uh, mechanism and physicalism, where we've been stuck for all too long. Uh, and we have to be evidence-based. Evidence, and one frame of the evidence is these spiritual experiences and these psi phenomena, that, that those are important pieces of evidence as to insights about what are the characteristics of the non-Boolean order uh, that are part of reality more inclusively understood. So I think we've just very barely begun to consider the implications of that evidence and, and to allow ourselves to be led where that evidence points to, to a better uh, 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 inclusive uh, understandings. And the understandings eventually are both scientific and philosophical. You just can't, adequate understanding of the systems inclusively involves both science and the humanities. Uh, uh, all of these disciplines. It, it can't be done by some truncated scientism. That's all. Thank you, Tim. So at this point, I think we should open it up uh, to dialogue with all of our participants. Uh, there are a couple of great questions in the chat. Um, I know, Anderson, you were first. But I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Thomas to ask his question just because it seems more directly relevant uh, to what Tim was sharing and then we'll go to Anderson next. Um, Thomas, do you want to unmute and... Hi, Tim. Uh, I'm, my question is regarding your use of the term pre-space. Um, and I'm wondering, is that uh, in any way related to the way that uh, Reg Cahill in process physics uses the term pre-geometry or uh, perhaps uh, Penrose's use or Penrose's understanding of mathematical entities as uh, having an analogical reality that is outside of space-time. Um. Yes, I, 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 yes, I'm, I'm suggesting that the ontological reality uh, at the, this most fundamental level, so to speak, is pre-space. Uh, that is that, uh, it, like in Cahill's, uh, Cahill and Klinger's uh, uh, theoretical effort, they have pointed to the possibility of an information theoretic approach that then from which they can eventually retrieve elements of quantum field theory and uh, aspects of, of uh, theory of gravity. Uh, 
And, uh, and most interesting, uh, Klinger's work indicates how you can use an information theoretic approach to retrieve why it is that the fundamental, uh, say, uh, dimension is limited to three dimensions uh, in a way that I've very few other theoretical frameworks enable that to come out in a natural way. Uh, so it's, it's a notable promise to that kind of approach. Uh, yet I think, um, so, so it, it, I'm just pointing to, I used the term pre-space. I, I didn't use pre-space time because that was a little more, uh, you know, longer and a little more cumbersome. I just wanted to emphasize that I wanted to, as a pointer to the notion of actualized times, uh, actualized time space intervals and metric is an output of the fundamental process. Uh, I'm just using pre-space as a pointer to a more fundamental level in the fundamental succession of events uh, that, so to speak, is at the uh, in, in the in the quantum process at, of where you have the transition of possibility to more limited probabilities to finalize outputs uh, with an emphasis on the uh, that component of the fundamental process prior to actual, actualized outputs that then can be externalized and put into grids and treated in a metric. So, so yeah, the, the cahill Klinger approach is an effort to get at some of this fundamental process via information theoretic approach and is in com an incomplete project program. Uh, others have tried it. Uh, and uh, it, it has some promise, uh, so I, it needs to me. It needs to be taken seriously. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Um, Anderson, do you want to to chime in at this point and share your question about orality? Yes, I do. I'm also typing in comments. <laughs> I don't think I can do another one. Real quick, let me just finish the comment I'm typing. Uh, if you don't mind, for a good episode. Uh, uh, it's probably full of uh, misprints. Okay, so I uh, yeah, it's a simple point. Um, I think that Dan is underestimating the extent to which there is a kind of quasi permanence and also analysis in orality. Um, I assume that Dan had a chance to read my comment. Um, he probably have responses ready. So I just you know. Um, Early in the discovery of the formulaic nature of orality, there was this sort of silly interpretation that the, the repetition of formulas apparently meant that it was mechanical and arbitrary. The rhapsodes, you know, had trouble remembering, so they were just throwing stuff together. But if you look close, you see that's not what's going on at all. The repetition of exact formulas is very cleverly de deployed to create ironies and contrasts and suggest that things that are otherwise seem different or in fact related. So there's a lot of analysis going on, um, even in the use of repetition. So the, 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 the permanence is achieved through repetition and the analysis is achieved through uh, what, what, what to them would have been very obvious variations of the formula. It's like, whoa, oh wait, and now you're, what, what, you, what, what usually applies to the gods is now being applied to the, the humans. What a surprise that must mean there's some kind of connection we have to think about there. So what do you say to that? that there, there is still some analysis and some permanence that prefigures a lot of the the possibilities of writing. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. It's a very interesting issue. You've got your finger on there. So I um, wonder if I could respond this way that um, so suppose uh, the two of us were in a room together um, and I said something to you. And, and it's a thought experiment. Suppose I said something really important. So you just have to let your imagination wander here. This is unlikely, but so as it was it's a piece of information that really was important and we would have to preserve it. Um, and we, we, we're not uh, in a condition of literacy, right? So it has to be done orally. Um, mm -hmm. this, this is a problem to be solved because the oral transmission of the Lagos involves what? The vibration of my vocal cords and then the, the, my sa the sound would then hit your eardrums uh, and, and sound waves are not as fast as light right, waves, but still pretty fast and then the, the word, the Lagos, would pass out of existence, right? Um, so uh, whereas if I had written something down, you know, we could preserve it, you know, in, in a much easier manner. 
Um, now, this does not mean, and I'm, I'm conceding this point to you, um, um, this does not mean that there, we could not solve this problem, but it is a problem to be solved so that in preliterate cultures, um, uh, the worthy information like how to sail a ship or how to go crops and so on uh, yeah. uh, uh, is preserved by what? Uh, mnemonic devices like sing-songy cadences, rhymes at the end of lines, and as you emphasize, repeat performances so that people could remember them because they're, you know, presented with stories about the gods and goddesses and how to sail ships and so on on a regular basis. So it, it is a problem to be solved. That's the point I'm trying to emphasize. And I, I concede you, to you that it could be solved, uh, but it's a problem you don't even have to confront in any significant way in a literate context. Now, Tim's position is called the Logoi framework, right? So or, or automatically he has a use of the plural there, right? So that there are different ways of uh, conveying and understanding and presenting the Lagos. Um, I'm trying to point out the differences here between orality and literacy. Um, is it possible to get the sort of high level analysis that's involved in the sort of project that Tim is engaged, engaged in mm. on an oral, oral basis? Um, mm. I'm, I'm willing to grant that there's some sort of incipient or proto analysis that could occur in the oral presentation of myth, but um, it's just hard for me to imagine high-level mathematics and physics and philosophy occurring um, without literacy. So it's not an all-or-nothing thing. Um, but uh, uh, and there are some things that orality is much better at than literacy. And I take it this is the point I was trying to make about Plato's dialogues that Plato didn't want to write treatises the way Aristotle did. Right? Plato wanted to preserve the intimacy of communication between two or three or four people in a room together, you know, debating things. Uh, there was something about the, the uh, immediacy of oral communication that Plato thought worthy of preservation. And, and, and in that regard, orality is better than literacy and it, because there's something distant about literacy. Um, because in a way, when you write something, your audience is always a fiction that you're imagining in your head but if you're in a room with somebody talking to them, uh, you know who's listening to you and it's very personal. So I think there's strengths and weaknesses each to orality and literacy. And I wanted to bring those to the fore, just if only because Tim was trying to make the case that Black Elk is doing something similar to what he's doing. Uh, and I think that might be right, but I think it needs some footnotes. <laughs> Thank you. Very interesting. Um, let's see, Douglas, do you want to share your question? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, I think Dan just got to, um, a little bit of it. I'm making a bit of a reach, um, with a question to both, uh, Tandeka and to, to Dan. Um, and I think there's maybe some interaction between, between those two questions. Um, uh, Tandeka talks about the concept of distress and that being resolved by musicality. And I was wondering if Tandeka would e equate uh, that sense of distress to the Buddhist um, perspective on suffering. And then, um, as Dan was just alluding to, you know, it, um, it, uh, you know, there is a distinctive difference between um, uh, you know, the written and the oral. And um, uh, you know, Buddhist teaching also has a practice of uh, transmitting um, uh, traditions, teachings, especially for one who wants to become qualified to pass on those teachings uh, via an oral or mechanism, not just reading it. I don't know if he could go any further on, on that subject, maybe in that concept of distress. Thank you. Shall I? Shall I respond? Great. Um, Great. Um, separation, separation distress. distress. I hear an echo. Okay. Separation distress, like anticipatory anxiety, fear, rage, and other primal emotional organizing systems of the brain has specific neurochemical 
processes, which is why the neuroscientists could track them. So in this way, I would not want to equate the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism and suffering, dukkha, with the neurochemical processes that are constitutive of the lowest portions of parts of the lowest portions of the human brain. I would, however, like to note something that Dan said that I find rather quizzical or curious. Um, Dan said that, and he was echo echoing Tim here, but Dan said, absolute nothingness is not intelligible. Absolute nothingness is not intelligible. Well, according to the Kyoto School of Buddhism, and particularly Nishitani, who wrote a book called Religion and Nothingness, in which he argues that Husserl and Descartes were almost correct, but they didn't understand nothingness. <laughs> so let's focus on what this is really all about, right, from a Buddhist perspective. Or we can look at Hegel and the science of logic, who says, think nothing, pure nothingness. It has already become something. Or we can combine Kant and Plotinus, because Plotinus's question was, what is the relationship between the one and is? The one is. What's the relationship between the two? So Kant has given, gave us the notions of synthetic and analytic judgments. So we can use Kant's analysis of an analytic judgment of nothingness, of no thing, to understand how no thing in Western Kantian terms is intelligible through Hegel, and it's this. If you think of the propositional claim, nothing is, subject predicate, nothing is, the term nothing cancels is. It's a self-canceling process. Nothing is, paradoxically meaning that something is and something is not at the same time as the mind tracks the way in which no thing, nothing cancels that which defines it, what moves is the mind itself, which is what the Buddhists try to get at through koans. Because intelligibility is a low level of consciousness but the movement of the mind itself, which is not the mind, but the brain consists of patterning principles and the brain reads patterning principles by the way in which the brain itself is affected by the patterning principles. Okay. Well, uh, certainly it's useful to think about no thing and say in the dynamics of you know, affirming you know, during and denial and say in a dynamic way to that the notion of nothing, no thing can be very, 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 very useful and helpful. Uh, I think the point that I'm making and Dan is re re reiterating is the notion of absolute nothingness. Uh, that the notion of absolute nothingness is very problematic and arguably without uh, coherence. Uh, and that, that particular point was argued in some detail uh, in, uh, by, uh, uh, George? Yeah, I, yeah, right now I'm having a senior moment. George Shields? George Shields. No. Oh, no. George? No, no, well, George Shields too, in terms of the fundamental, you know, the, the fundamental triadic of the, uh, that, that uh, in, in the very nature of things, uh, but the, uh, the the the, Ger the German theologian uh, that I've referenced in my uh, uh, my Lorenz Puntel, Lorenz Puntel, in two of his works that are in German been translated to English, uh, 
goes into some detail about what's meant by the denial of absolute nothingness. Yeah. Wasn't it, was it Niels Bohr who said, if you make a claim that something is absolutely false, then its opposite also has to be absolutely the case. Well, uh, I think uh, well, it, it's kind of an issue in logic, um, perhaps. But I, I'm just uh, say if you're go the issue here is about the coherence of the notion of absolute nothingness, and you know the the argument is that as a notion, as a concept, it's incoherent. Uh, that's so. So it is, isn't even subject to the notion. You know, th this kind of dialectic of this or that. May I add one more note to this? When Thomas Merton moved into a certain state as a mystic, he wrote that he watched his ego disintegrate at the point of infinity. He then said that when I am in this state, I as a Catholic monk, priest, whatever, cannot even say there is a God because no thing is present. To which the Dalai Lama reported, he's the only Christian I've met who actually understands mysticism. Yeah, I, I support that kind of, you know, that kind of language and description can make some sense. I, I What I'm saying doesn't contradict that. Okay. The denial of absolute nothingness in the sense I'm, no, no, if you have absolutely no basis for even reflection on it, there's no basis for even, you know, absolute nothingness denies radically everything. Uh, so how can that be coherent? It's, so, so that but, but by virtue of even affirming the dialectic, you're affirming something that is against the notion of absolute nothingness. So I right, yes, and Schleiermacher yeah. calls it the null point of consciousness because from the standpoint of the mind, no thing is present. But from the standpoint of the body, the entire manifold, the unbounded universe, is present, and the two are there together. Which is why conceptually you cannot articulate it in a logical way, even multi in a multi-logical way, but nevertheless you have to affirm it because experientially you felt it. Yeah, I think we're coming up here against the 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 boundary between or the difference between logical thought and mystical feeling. Uh, and you know, when I when I think of what mystics describe in terms of uh, an experience of nothingness or emptiness or sunyata in, in Buddhist terms. Um, they're not talking about what, say, George Shields or, or Bergson, uh, maybe Parmenides we were talking about in a logical context, um, because we cannot conceive of nothingness in a coherent way, even if mystics will want to describe metaphorically this experience as a kind of emptiness. Does this help reconcile the two perspectives or is this? Do you think that Bergson is getting at this when he makes the distinction between time and duration? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's one way. Of Which is why he calls his philosophy an organic philosophy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have it in concrescence as well. Mm -hmm. Whitehead's notion of concrescence. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Jude, did you want to chime in on this point? I saw your comment. No, I just, you know, I think what I was saying in the chat was akin to um, what how you put it in terms of, of a sort of logical model of, of intelligibility. I bristled a little. I'm wondering, I think it's there's something about the conceptualization process that that generally philosophers mean by by intelligibility but that whole con the whole notion of con concepts is fraught right and part of it strikes me that part of the work of all of these weeks of conversation 
is really to reconstruct the conceptualization process in, in a more than nominal or, or you know, um, extraneous way, like at a really fundamental way. That strikes me what Tim is doing is reconceptualizing our philosophical terms. And so there's always going to be this both delightful connection with everything else in philosophy, but also the tension with the way those things have gone on. Um, I was, I'm sorry, when you first offered to bring me in, I was lost in thought about Tandeka's point about uh, the Bergson's distinction between time and um, and experience, time and duration. Um, and I was making some notes to myself about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, but it, it captures this sense that the the traditionally, not just traditionally, but the the whole history of thought that's con that has framed concepts in a certain way, and Bergson is the genius of this, has hampered our actual intelligence about things intelligibility sort of in the way of intelligence and that my Dewey, you know, is resonating in my head when I say that. That's all. <laughs> Thanks, Jude. Uh, let's see, I think Kevin, Kevin Clark had a question. Do you want to, oh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Kevin. And then I see Anderson's been patiently waiting as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Tim. Um, <clears throat> I would like to um, ask this question, uh, and it's about the ground of potentia. So starting on page 254, you move from an intimate universal uh, to talking about a ground of potentia. And, um, and then are quite uh, develop uh, that, notion about a ground of potentia in the next few pages. And I'm personally uncomfortable with the word ground, as it has a sort of substantialist ring to me as a process person. And uh, you quote, uh, talking about ultimate grounds for meaning, you quote, quote Neville, where he talks about uh, ground or context. So, and then I, I think someplace else later you use uh, the word context rather than ground, although you use the quest for the ground quite a bit. So I, I have, uh, I'm uncomfortable with the notion of a ground and much more comfortable in a process context, a process context of using the word context. And, um, and so I just kind of want to ask you if the word context, uh, is a, it might be a better way of thinking about potentia. And then, you know, you, you talk about that and, and you go um, from uh, talking about a, a context has to have, I mean, the um, potentia has to have some ground in where that is. And you suggest Whitehead's answer on page uh, 258. And then on 261, you kind of quote, Whitehead regarding that issue um, so that, you know, potentia can't be nowhere according to the ontological principle. It has to be housed in some actuality, some actual entity. And, and you kind of get at that. So that's the first kind of question I'd like for you to expand on. The second one is the whole notion of a dialectic. And you talk once again in this quote from Neville about the ontological ultimate is really the question of the one and the many, and then you call it a dialectic. I'd rather look at it from the, a, a dipolar, uh, rather than some kind of coincidence of opposites, it's a dipolar question of the, the whole and the part as a, as a sort of uh, way of framing it rather than some kind of, dialectic that has some notion of the coincidence of opposites in it. And I think the, the notion of a dipolar framing uh, is better for you because it, it's, a, once again, the whole and the part kind of perspective. That's what I'm asking. It, 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 would that be congenial with what you're doing and thinking? And, and could you explain 
and or expand upon these two notions of a ground of potentia and um, you know, the dialectics of the one and the many. Thank you. Well, um, so yeah, Kevin, I, uh, I accept your uh, suggestion as a, uh, a uh, thoughtful, supportive uh, uh, suggestion to, uh, to, to uh, attend to the one and the many, the uh, not, not so to speak, you know, perhaps more in the mode of the dipolar, uh, a la Hartshorn and Whitehead uh, versus say a dialectic, which can sometimes be thought of just in terms of uh, the linguistic usage and so forth. Uh, I, uh, when I'm thinking about dialectic, I'm often sort of thinking in terms of the somatic relation of the necessary triadic relation of things, input, output, context, and the inevitable, you know, interrelation of, of things. I'm usually not simply thinking in terms of the more epistemological uh, 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 usages. I so uh, so I take that as a uh, you know, as a as a good reminder on that. Um, let's see. I, remind me of the first point you made. Um. The context, context rather than the ground. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. I, so I was working with, uh, at the point when I realized that if I were to, so to speak, you know, work with, say, the notion of two fundamental orders, and then I have the order of actualization and the order of potential relations, and then in that order of potential, you know, of course, you have this radical pluralism of the sets of actualizations out there. That's that's the plur, that's the radical, you know, radically plural plurality of uh, standard uh, uh, ways of thinking of the world. I mean, and, and you know, of the way the world really is. It's very, you know, the, the actualized world, radically plural. And then, and then. You have the pluralism monist contrast. Well, the monist contrast doesn't fit very well with the, the, that pluralistic world out there. But when you introduce a order of uh, potential of, of the uh, potential relations, uh, then arguably the the domain of actual, actualizations, which has been the output of lots of of uh, a, a, a symmetry breaking processes at the at the quantum level, you know, radical symmetry breaking at every every particular actualization, even though the fun, you know, so to speak, the the characteristics of symmetry that are reflected in the basic physics uh, that that come from constraints on possibility, that the symmetries are are uh, you know reflected in different ways in the ordering of those actualizations, and yet that that order of potential. Uh, it, it has, so to speak, a symmetry of, uh, the, there's a symmetry versus the asymmetry. The, uh, the, there's an implication of, uh, say, a unity versus the, the, the radical plurality. Uh, and then, uh, so from the scientific standpoint, it, it had a sense that, yes, there was a way of, uh, some, some way of framing the unity, but how, did, how do I make reference to that? And so I saw different philosophers would use the ground sometimes as one word for such, you know, a basis for. Uh, uh, but that, but I didn't intend it to be, so to speak, a substantialist imposition. Uh, I didn't want to go with substantial because that's, after all, what I'm denying in terms of the distinction of the fundamental orders. Uh, and yeah, so that's a good point. I uh, uh, I'm not quite sure. You know, the other alternatives are definitely welcome. Uh, yeah, but 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 what's the basis for it? What so we have this order of potential, uh, the, the possible relations, and there's some unity. And what's the what's the basis for the unity? And it seems like to me it, it strikes me that if you 
don't go the route of saying, well, it could be radically, you know, ultimately a radical meaninglessness or radical nothingness as being possibilities, then, then there has to be an affirmation of some basis for the unity. Uh, and I, I, I see no way out of that. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Kim. Time for um, two more questions. Uh, Anderson will go first, and then I'll read a question from Monica in the chat. So go ahead, Anderson. Okay, thank you. So, um, so Fandika, you've been making such interesting and tantalizing comments um, throughout these sessions. I feel like I've been waiting six months to finally talk to you. So I have some questions. Let's see how many we might be able to get through. The first is simply a plea that you make available to us the text that you read to us today. Would you be willing to do that? Yes, and also since I take it from my book, I uh, plead I, for you. To my then, book, then, but I will send you a copy. Book. I will send you a copy of my comments, but all of it's in my book. I'll buy your book. It's my simple. latest book. Thank you. Okay. Now, at one point, um, you uh, mentioned something that you've mentioned several times, the middle point of consciousness, where there is a, a, um, where, where there's both an all and a nothing. Uh, the intellect is at a stage of nothing, but the organic is at a stage of everything. Is that right? Yes. Where is that passage, please? I cannot find it. Is it in, is it in the dialectic of 18? Uh, oh, oh, yes, it's in the dialectic. 18, and 18. my first, yes, my first book is on his dialectic. Okay. So and I, then I use affective neuroscience, and thus that was in conversation with Yach for over a decade, the founder of affective neuroscience, because I wanted to translate Schleiermacher's insights yeah. into 21st century neuroscientific terms using the science of emotions. And okay. thus Yach and I carried on a conversation for a decade in which he sometimes helped me. I would send him stuff that I'd written on Schleiermacher and say, here's how I've translated into your terms. And then Jacques would tweak it. And thus in his last book, he said that my work allowed for non-denominational foundation for religious experience, which is Schleiermacher brought into the 21st century. Excellent, okay. So Did just you... one other point here. Yes. It's the point that Kevin brought up and um, Tim commented upon about dipolarity and the coincidence of opposites. From the standpoint of reason, and this is Whitehead, this is Tim, this is Schleiermacher, you have to describe any human, ex human experience from the standpoint of the organism and the reflections upon the organism by the brain, by a different part of the brain. So it's, you have to, these are dipolar experiences. Tracked from the standpoint of human experience as a lived experience, which is what William James was trying to get at when he took the nitrous oxide, he saw, right, the opposites merge experientially which you find descriptions of in spiritual experiences all over the world, which Schleiermacher identified as the place where one thought ends and the other thought begins. They never, there never is a coincidence of the two. They never meet. He called that space the in-between place and that's where he located the spiritual dimension of human experience and any positive claim about it is a religious construction and therefore anthropomorphic. Is and thus the Buddhist understanding of shunyata, uh -huh. the closest I've seen to this delineation in Western um, classic philosophical reflections is Schleiermacher's explanation of the null point of consciousness, which is why he was so badly misunderstood. As you know, in his letters to Luca, um, he said, because he was criticized for being an atheist, a paganist, this, that, he said, I can't respond until they at least agree upon what I violated. And what he had violated 
was the foundation of Christian experience as the conscience, he set that aside. He said, no, it's affected. It's the coincidence in this way that we experientially have of the infinite universe in a finite moment of our own lives, which the Buddhists call codependent origination. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the, uh, the emptiness between thoughts, that's why you spoke about on shaung occurring between thoughts is that the idea that the connection that's right which james to refers to as the right. perforated edges of consciousness okay and uh now you you at one point uh deployed this as a deliberate critique and correction of hegel i'm wondering if you have time to repeat that for us now absolutely uh, in a Shai slow, in a slow yes. way Okay, okay, Schleiermacher prevented Hegel from getting into the academic, you know, the academy, uh, because Hegel said that between, you know, the, the synthesis and the antithesis, excuse me, the, antith the, the thesis and the antithesis, there's a synthesis, which Hegel counted as a third thing. The synthesis for Hegel was a third thing. Schleiermacher said, no, it's not a third thing. It's the middle way. This is pure Schleiermacher out of his dialectic. It's between thought. This part of Schleiermacher is not adequately understood because he made this the foundation for his invention of liberal theology, but he put this affective foundation in psychology and ethics and aesthetics and thus stripped liberal religion of a doctrine of human nature and thus Schleiermacher's theology is read as if he's talking about conscience is foundational. Okay, excellent. Now, you, there was one more clever thing you did, if we have a minute. You then applied this to Whitehead and said you, that there was a, a parallel between this in between, this on show that was both all What is it? What is it? Concrescence. Explain, explain to my one, one brain cell, please, if you may. It's Gosh, <laughs> and if Don is online or someone else, please help me out. Even though I did my dissertation, part of my, you know, orals on this, it's the coming, it's, it's the coming, it's, it's, okay, the many become one and is increased by one. That process by means of which a, an actual occasion comes to, and I'm using, I'm weak here in Whiteheadian terms but it's this process, it's the causal efficacy, it's the way in which something comes to be. Mm -hmm. and, and John Cobb has said to me in this way that Whitehead's work is a philosophy on emotion. Mm -hmm. So okay. how does a thought come to be? How do we get to another thought? That's Schleiermacher's transition point, the in-between point. What's going on there? And that's what I believe Whitehead is trying to delineate, which is why he's invented a new language. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It was a very challenging question. I appreciate you for responding. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking. Does my response make sense to you? Yes, it does. And I'm gonna to have to read all of your books apparently, but that's fine. I'm gonna enjoy doing it. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, and I note that this uh, reference to the between reminds me about uh, enjoying uh, William Desmond's book, The Being in the Between. And, <laughs> and I find Tim's work so extraordinary because you have articulated it clearer than I have found in any other contemporary work. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Tim, do you have? Do you think we have time for one more or should we save it for next time? Well, we could certainly do, uh, have, you know, use the wrap up to you know, just allow for uh, addressing multiple things. I, uh, I, I would say only just a few words during the wrap up in a month from now. Uh, in terms of right now, I don't think I need to say anything on wrap up. I noticed it's that it was, time for another question. There was one, one I think there is that. time for one question. I, I had, did note, by the way, that uh, John Meyer asks about the issue of the order of ultimacies and relating to eternal objects and uh, 
I, the reason I didn't use eternal objects, and I mentioned this in uh, untying about uh, Whitehead's use of eternal objects, I, it, it just struck me as too much uh, that, that the instantiation of platonic forms was a little bit too much in the uh, in, in kind of the term eternal objects. Uh, in, and I, I can understand you know, how Whitehead came to use it that way, but for my purpose of reference to uh, the uh, order of uh, potential of, uh, of, uh, of potential relations and so forth, I generally thought it was uh, more in keeping with my overall project to uh, avoid that kind of uh, uh, instantiating plat platonic forms in a way that might seem too substantialist. So that's that's all. All right. Um, so Tim, there was one more question from uh, Monica, but it is it's I think rather involved, and um, maybe we can I can share that with you over email. Uh, Unless you want to take another few minutes. Oh yeah, oh, Monica. Uh, yeah, the, the last day. Thank you. Yeah, and for pre, and pregigene and uh, so to speak, nested sequences. Ultimately, the universe. Yeah, I, by all means. Uh, in fact, I refer to this kind of a notion of multiple levels uh, a number of times in my book. Um, uh, yes, I mean complex systems. Uh, there's complex systems at, at, at all levels and so to speak the emergence at multiple levels uh, but in combination with the the uh, this fundamental process I speak of which is uh, I, I would argue embodied at multiple levels and 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 I th then use use as well this argument about uh, the, the modeling process uh, for complex systems from Robert Rosen and, and related about the uh, uh, in, enfolding and unfolding uh, in terms of the, the model of it, the two-way uh, framing of things that then is happening at multiple levels. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that, that's just part of a good basic description of, of systems. The, uh, but then again, you see that doesn't do the job by itself. Uh, that in terms of getting at the fundamental uh, philosophic and uh, the issue of meaning, you know, the, the issues of that I'm getting to in chapter eight, the about issues, issues of ultimate meaning, the basis and the, the term meaning itself, uh, that cannot be addressed simply by some combination of propositions about the fact of the multiple levels. Great. Thank you, Tim. Well, as Jude said, these two hours are going way too fast, but luckily we do have one more session. Uh, thank you all for your participation, your attention. Thank you to our respondents, uh, Tandeika, uh, Dan, Ed, and thank you to Tim. Um, this has been a lot of fun.